Okay, good afternoon everyone. Glad to have you with us for today's webinar. My name is Andrew Farr. I'm the Managing Editor of Water Finance and Management. Uh, so it's my pleasure to be hosting this webinar today. Uh, we've been looking forward to this one. Uh, this webinar is titled Maximizing the Capabilities of a Two-Way Smart Utility Network During Deployment. Sponsored by Census, a Xylem brand. And uh, today we're going to be covering an AMI deployment by Water One. Uh, if you're not familiar, a water utility serving the Johnson County, Kansas area. Um, right now we're going to launch a quick poll question uh, before we get started. So you should see that popping up on your screens now. Uh, go ahead and submit an answer to that, and then you can click the blue return to presentation button. Uh, this poll just kind of helps us to, to get a better idea of who's online with us today. So we would appreciate it. And just a, a couple housekeeping items then before we get started. I, I want to mention uh, questions. Um, obviously, we're, we're going to go through our, our presentation uh, with, with PowerPoint. Uh, we have several presenters that are going to be uh, in the mix here today. Uh, if anyone has any questions throughout the presentation, we're going to be doing some Q&A at the end with our presenters. Uh, you should see the questions panel on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, you can maximize that, that viewing window and minimize it, uh, but you can submit questions right there on that questions panel, and I encourage you to do so if you have any questions at all. Um, we'll be doing some Q, when we do Q&A at the end, I'll, I will try and get through as many questions as we can. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, today we're covering maximizing the capabilities of a two-way smart utility network during deployment. Um, this, this particular topic, uh, talking about AMI deployment, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to this because we have uh, not only the, the utility, uh, the, the installer, and the, 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 the manufacturer uh, being census uh, on board. Um, it's always good when we can sort of get the, the perspective from the whole project team uh, on these types of projects. And, you know, you really to get a, a, the, the full scope of, of what goes into all these projects. Um, so to introduce our presenters, we are going to have Brian Shade, Metering, Meter Services Manager with Water One, Mike Wood, Chief of Technology with Utility Use, and Joseph Dreyer, Solution Application Manager with Census. And Joe, I believe you're going to kick things off for us. So uh, whenever you're ready, I will go ahead and uh, kick it over to you, Joe. Alrighty, thanks Andrew. So hi everyone, and uh, thanks for joining the webinar today. Uh, you may have heard the term two-way network, and you may have heard that in reference to advanced metering infrastructure, or AMI. And uh, today, we're here to tell you about how Water One is using such a two-way uh, AMI network uh, during deployment in, in a rather novel way. And uh, presenting today, as Andrew mentioned, is gonna be Brian Shade from Water One, and uh, Mike Wood from Utility Use, that's the uh, installation and work order uh, field management partner uh, on the project, and then, and then myself from Census. Um, and later on, we are gonna have a Q&A session. Uh, during that, we're actually gonna have two more folks join us on the discussion. That'll be Carla from Water One and Bill from Utility Use as well. So to uh, kick things right off here, um, you know, just an agenda, a little bit about what we're going to cover during this session. So first of all, uh, Brian's going to give you some background on Water One, and then we're going to tell you uh, how and why they move towards advanced metering infrastructure. Uh, we're also going to be introducing their system architecture, in other words, how everything works together uh, for Water One. We're going to be talking about how they're approaching deployments and field installations, and in particular, uh, how they're using the two-way network uh, for kind of a new approach where metering devices are actually configured remotely uh, over the system uh, after installation. And then finally, we're going to be closing things out by discussing what's next for Water One and some of the other applications and use cases that they will be pursuing um, beyond just metering with, with the AMI network. So, uh, Getting right off here, I'm going to turn it over to Brian uh, to introduce you to Water One. Take it away, Brian. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Appreciate it. And what you see right there is a picture of our administrative offices for Water One. And I'm going to give you a little background on 
our utility, and then how we wound up uh, selecting this uh, AMI solution. So on the screen, Water One is located in, we'll call it the middle of America, in the Kansas City metropolitan area. So Water One, we're located on the southwest side of the Kansas City area over on the Kansas side. To our east and to the northeast is Kansas City, Missouri Water, and then to our north is the utility of Board of Public Utilities for our Kansas City, Kansas partners to the north, and we have interconnects between them. And then on the screen, you can just kind of see some values of regarding the size of our water utility. It's an estimated population of about 440,000 served. We have roughly 151,000 service connections and a firm capacity of 200 million gallons of water per day. And Water One's kind of an an odd entity, I think. Uh, we are a public utility by our customers and for our customers. We are led by an elected governing board, and we were formed in 1957 that came out of, from a private water utility that wasn't meeting the needs of its customers. What we're considered is a quasi-municipality, which means that we're fully independent from the cities and the county that we serve and from their control, yet we have the right to be in the right-of-way. Also, Water One has no taxing authority, and we fund our operations entirely through service fees and the water that we sell. So unlike other municipal services provided by local governments, uh, we just only have one and one job only, and that is potable water. Now, our, our water supply in sources is Water One has three water sources. We have two surface water intakes. We have a surface water intake on the Kansas River and another surface water intake on the Missouri River. These intakes are considered by us as pre-sedimentation facilities. It's really the main goal to remove the suspended solids and begin the disinfection contact time from the pipelines from these facilities back to our water treatment plant. And I'd just like to point out that the nickname for the Missouri River is the Big Muddy. The water treatment plant then from there partially softens and, re and treats the water. And we just are in the process of bringing on a new ozone system to provide disinfection and reduction of the occasional taste and odor issues that we might have. Our third source of water is a collector well intake located on the Missouri, Missouri River 2, and it's located upstream of the sur other surface water intake on the Missouri River. So the finished water from that surface water intake is pumped directly into the, the uh, distribution system from that point. And as mentioned before, our, our firm capacity is 200 million gallons per day. And uh, we are able to provide water to a customer roughly, you know, a penny for two gallons. So our, our meter base uh, size, well, we're typically a, a suburban, we are mainly a suburban, suburban water utility. So on the screen on the right, you'll see the, our, our top 10 customers, but our number one customer there only makes up 0.4% of our, our revenue. And being a suburban water utility, our in 2019, our residential customers were nearly 63% of our revenue. Uh, our multifamily customers were just a little bit over 10%, and then the remaining, our, our CNI customers, were just under uh, 27%. So in 2019, the volume of water delivered to our distribution system was 19.46 billion gallons. The volume that we metered was 16.86 billion gallons, which means that our unmetered water was 13.42%. Now, being a suburban water utility, we have, I think it's pretty obvious, there are a lot of small meters, a lot of 5 8 inch meters for our residential customers. And we also are mainly a census water utility. That pie chart with the, with the green is just showing the majority of our water meters are census water meters, but we do have another, a smaller population made up of Hersey, Badger, and Neptune meters, so we are willing to use other meter manufacturers uh, to measure our water. The age of our water meters is uh, roughly 88% of them are 20 years or newer, and we means that we have about 12% of our meters that are in the 20 to 30 year range. However, we do have annual capital projects that are replacing these meters, and we do plan on being complete with those projects to replace those meters within the next three years. So that's going to bring me to our first, well, I guess our second poll question, and that is wanting to find out what is your primary meter reading method, and what we'd like you to do is you might have more than one meter reading method that you use, but uh, like we actually have a couple ourselves, so if you have one that you'd like to select and pass along, and we will then evaluate that and provide that information. 
in a, in a moment here. So I'll give it just a, maybe a, just a little bit more time, and uh, and then we'll continue on. And I don't know if you're still entering or, or providing a, a response, but uh, as I see, we have about uh, looks like we are at about 11% that are direct manual read, about 6% are touch read, and then you have you know about 41% that are drive by, and then another 41% with the AMI network. Looks like it's changing still a little bit, but uh, I will then continue on back with the presentation. What that's going to bring us to is what was Water One's and what is Water One's uh, meter reading method. So this is a progression of our meter reading. This is kind of starting and taking a little snapshot here in 2016. I just want to tell, I used this slide in a different presentation and I just like minions and just want to provide some levity in a different presentation I had. I hope you enjoy minions on the slide. But uh, what I wanted to point out is back in 2016 is we still had about 16,000 meters that had no ability to be read remotely because it were they were direct read meters and so what we decided to do was enter in, into a contract with a, a meter installation contractor and we have had those meters replaced uh, about a year and a half ago however the rest of our meters were at least touch read and uh, if you're not familiar with the touch read it still required a meter reader to go to the meter pit lid anyway and at least interrogate the meter to get a read we had about 5,000 meters in our drive-by because we have uh, some you know, hard to read meters or difficult to find meters and it just made it easier to drive by and uh, get those. And then our commercial and multifamily accounts, they're a little bit different for Water One. Those customers are billed monthly. Our residential customers are billed bi-monthly. And back in 2005, we took our monthly customers and put them underneath a network that was existing over our service area, and uh, we are obtaining the reads that way. But that's what brings us into the looking at the AMI solution. So 2005, the contract we had with our network was going to expire on December 31st, 2019, and we were going to have to make a decision. So the decision was is we were not going to go back to manual meter reading of our commercial and multifamily accounts just because they're monthly and just the cost to read that. So we knew that we were going to do something network-wise to continue to read those meters. But while we were looking at that, we were evaluating the technology from 2005 to determine should we bring the rest of our customer base into a remote meter read network or an AMI system. So what we did is we looked at our business case, and this is this snapshot here is where we were. And, and what we want to get to. So where we are is to being a bi-monthly, this is for our residential customers, but being a bi-monthly billing utility just means in the center there, we only have six data points a year. And we just broke that into a couple or into four buckets about what does that mean? So from a customer service perspective, we just have very little information on our customers when you only have six data points or because we're doing manual meter reading and was that read correct? So then we have to go back out in the field and just verify that the, that the read was actually what the meter reader read we do have winter here so occasionally we'll get snow on the ground and that makes it very difficult to read our meters and if that's the case we will wind up estimating the reads which get to be difficult when we finally get an actual read to maybe have to fix some bills after the fact for customer resources since we only bill every two months they do not get a pricing signal from us very often and so they don't know if they've had a leak or anything that's occurred on their system until, or in their house or their plumbing until they get a bill from us. And so even if they do call in or we go out and try to help them, we just don't have very much information for them uh, other than those six data points a year. Now, from a financial perspective, that bottom left, yes, we can bill customers, but one thing we can't do very fast is find broken meters or stuck meters. It does take a couple bill cycles in order to determine when you finally have no consumption that we need to go figure out what's going on with that meter. So it might take two to four months in order to finally replace that meter and start recording consumption on that customer. And then from operations, yes, we can still, from that information we collect in our billing system, be able to provide the information needed to calculate the, and for the annual water loss and also be able to provide information for calculating a, a global hydraulic model. So when I go to the next slide, I want you to look at the middle. So when you go into AMI solution, you're going to start, we're going to start getting hourly data. So you go from six data points a year to nearly, based on the customer base that we have, nearly 1.3 billion data points in a year, which is great, but what are you going to do with all that information, or why do you want all that information? So we reevaluated re on those same quadrants, you know, from the 
and the better customer service, we'll be able to have more information to determine what is going on with the customers or if they have, if they do call in and trying to figure out what is going on with their bill, we at least be able to, to see the time or whatever event may have occurred to cause that increased consumption. We'll be able to eliminate estimates because of a network. We will no longer have to, to do that. And then what we're looking at installing, and we're doing a pilot study right now, is on remote disconnect meters so we can eliminate the field trips for customers where we need to uh, uh, turn off their, or shut off water for non-pay. For better customer resources, we ultimately are going to be providing a customer portal in we're anticipating about March of next year with the idea to self-train and self-serve our customers to be able to set up alerts and become more aware and be, just become smarter with their water and figure out what is it is going on with their system. Now, the flexible billing options, it's not something we're implementing at this point, but it's something that we've thought about. We're, we're keeping our customers on their current billing cycles based upon when we read their meters. But if we get to the point where there's a, maybe an idea where a customer would like to be billed on the 1st or the 15th or sometime in the month, uh, you know, such as like a fixed income customer, we would be able to probably transition to something a little bit more easier for our customers if that demand uh, arises. On the bottom left with the better revenue protection and, and cost controls, well, we're going to be able to find these stuck meters a lot faster. We also have purchased a module that will try to evaluate the health of our meter population and determine if we can find meters that are slowing before they actually get to the, to the stuck part and uh, be able to replace them at an optimal time. We will be able to, you know, reduction in, in trips, and then the time of use is, is a, something that we're not implementing at this point, but it, it would be somewhat similar to like an electrical company with your demand charges. And I, our water utility, I imagine, is pretty similar to everyone else's where our, our diurnal curve, we get hit pretty pretty hard in the morning on when days when we're, customers are irrigating and you're having to build infrastructure to meet that max hour. But is there a benefit that we could actually do a demand charge to try to flatten that curve, if you will, and not have to build that infrastructure so we can meet that max hour, for example. So. Not something we're looking to implement anytime soon, but a, a demand charge or rate charge is something we could be could evaluate in the future. And then for the better operations, not really maybe the daily water loss, but we'd be able to calculate the water loss more frequently than what we do uh, for once a year. We'd also be looking to create those district metered areas where we could evaluate the dis smaller parts of your distribution system for leaks and leakage. We really have no idea what's going on with backflow, if how often it occurs or how much occurs it really so this will be able to give us more information on that and then with the network in place we're looking at being able to add additional sensors out there such as pressure and acoustical and then anything else we want to add from a water quality perspective so the cost what we did is look at the life cycle cost based on a 20-year system because what we anticipate is the battery that we're going to be installing to transmit this information from the meters will last 20 years, so we're, that's where we picked the 20-year life cycle cost. The second column is just a, ref, a reflection of the fact that we're going to install a network no matter what for our existing monthly customers, but what I really want to focus on is the far right column, which is looking at what it would cost all of our customers if we, impl if we installed an AMI system. So what we're looking at from the, the capital cost is, of course, the, the transmitter and the installation from, uh, from utilities from our contractor pointed out on the previous slides a couple slides ago about, well, we're going to be gathering all this data. What are you going to do with it? And so we wanted to make sure we accounted for, we needed a data analyst to help us assist with this information. Based on our experience with an AMI system, you're still having to maintain what's going on with the, the transmitters. And we do recognize we probably need an additional person to help us replace or repair, uh, well, probably generally replace radios that may have failed out in the field. And then the operating costs for, we decided to select software as a service and network as a service for our AMI solution. The life cycle cost avoidance is really the reduction, part of it is the reduction of force. We don't really, we won't need meter readers anymore. Uh, we will not, we'll be able to reduce part of our headcount for uh, field services. That was our group of people that would go out and get our move in, move out transfer reads and uh, do the, uh, the bill checks for our meter readers. In addition, we'll be able to reduce the number of vehicles that we need to uh, monitor our, our meter reading system. And then also we'll look at bringing in additional revenue by finding those stuck meters faster. So 
what we presented to our board was this is just how this will affect our customers just by replacing our traditional meter reading system with an AMI system and how will that uh, those costs affect our customers. And the net cost is, I know it says it's a reduction of three cents per bill, but really that's just, there's no monthly bill impact to our customers when you just compare traditional meter reading to installing an AMI system. So what the benefit we're going to get from this is if the cost is the same, we want to get all the additional information that we can from the data, and we'd like to move forward with, the, with an AMI system. So what we're looking for with our system requirements is we wanted to ensure that we could utilize our existing water meters. That's a, water meters to us, that's a separate asset management plan that we have in place as far as replacing water meters. And we wanted to select a system that could be able to utilize them. We wanted to make sure we had a you know, really robust utility-grade network and be able to communicate two ways, you know, back and forth between the meter and us. And in this case, we're going to talk about adjusting configurations. The turnkey solution we're looking for is the fact that we're looking for a network, an installer, the meter data management system to help us analyze the data, and a customer portal. And what we wound up selecting is census and their subcontractor installer utility use for one census for the network and utility use to install the transmitters. And then we're using the Harris SmartWorks platform for the meter data management system and our customer portal. So what I'd like to do is I think we'll turn this over to Joe. Thanks, Brian. So one thing that, uh, that Brian just mentioned is as part of the AMI um, solution that they're moving forward with is the, uh, the Census Network as a Service model, uh, also known as NAS. And just to dig into that a little bit more, um, you know, it stands for Network as a Service, and what it means is that Census is responsible for monitoring all the network operations uh, and ensuring coverage is maintained over the whole Water One service area. So on this diagram on the slide here, uh, NAS is this blue box that you're seeing uh, over the, the comms and the network portion as well as the head end SAS component, all right? And the scope of that is, is the base station collector towers and the software head end solution. Uh, you know, on the devices side, on the left side of that diagram, Water One does still own the meters and radios that are communicating over this network. And then on the right hand side, uh, you can see these NAS components are also interfacing with third-party software solutions such as the Harris uh, products that they're using for billis, uh, billing and, and, and customer portal as well. So in terms of the, the network that was put in place for Water One, um, this is what you're seeing on the slide here, uh, the, the network of towers that was designed for them. The pink dots are the tower base stations and the green areas are where coverage is achieved. And so Census always puts together uh, a unique radio frequency propagation study and then determines the best locations for these sites. And we try to make use of existing vertical assets in the service area, like for instance, water tanks uh, or other high buildings that are available. And really the advantage um, that Water One saw in, in having Census own the network portion uh, were a few things. So guaranteed performance, first of all, uh, as well as industry-leading security uh, practices and controls. Um, and that also no capital investment. So having that predictable uh, cost, that's, you know, that's definitely an advantage in terms of planning um, and, and financing. So in terms of the other things that this map is showing you, uh, one thing to note is the relatively small number of sites you know, on the order of about 23 as compared to potential other solutions. And that is really possible because uh, what we're doing here with Census is operating on a private FCC license spectrum. And so that eliminates transmission interference. Um, and it also allows us to transmit at higher output power um, uh, as opposed to working in a publicly licensed spectrum. Um, and then finally, you know, the key to this network is that it's two-way, all right? So these radio endpoints can both receive and send messages. And when I say radio endpoint, I'm talking about the, the smart point radio that is reading the meters. Um, and that really allows for a lot of benefits, like the ability to upgrade uh, both the radio and the meter firmware over the air, uh, as well as change configurations uh, on these devices remotely uh, through the network as well. So taking a look at the system architecture, um, you know, Water One definitely has a complex set of interfacing systems, as you can see here. 
but it all really starts with the meters out in the fields. And those consist, uh, you know, as Brian was mentioning earlier in the presentation, they consist of a variety of different meters, uh, you know, different meter types and, and manufacturers. And the neat thing about that is that all of these can be read using the same FlexNet smart point radios. Okay, so these radios are installed and programmed um, by util use, and we're going to hear more about util use from Mike in a few moments here. Uh, but what they're doing there is they're using the Novus Center software solution for the field work order management, and uh, also they're using Novus Center uh, for deployment information transfer to other systems, like for instance, uh, the daily batch of installs uh, that need to go to the CIS and the sensitive head ends. And so after installation, uh, these radios interface over the FlexNet system. Uh, again, that's, that's a NAS network as a service model there. And all of the hourly reading data makes its way into the CIS and billing systems, um, including the Harris systems like SmartWorks Compass, which is their MDMS, um, and which stands for Meter Data Management System, uh, as well as their customer connect portal. All right, and so we're gonna be covering each of those in a little bit more detail here in a bit. Um, but to talk more about the deployment and the Novus Center uh, software, I want to talk. I want to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Mike here. Thanks, Joe. Uh, appreciate it. Um, Mike Wood with Utility Use. Um, what we do at Utility Use is, I mean, we focus on being a, uh, an advanced metering implementation company for our partners in this instance for Water One and Census. As Joe mentioned, we have built a streamlined asset management system named Nova Center. Uh, the system provides the engine that utilities use, uh, uses to provide quality data, data validation, that kind of thing. Uh, Nova Center integrates with the CIS system and our team uses uh, mobile handhelds with that system and that utilize technology as well as inventory information to really minimize the data input uh, during the whole process for installation activation process. On Water One Project, um, as Joe mentioned, we integrated bi-directionally with their with uh, the RNI, the Census Regional Network Interface, to do the over-the-air uh, reprogramming, and uh, also uh, Census is through that automated process is also validating a lot of data. Uh, Nova Center can, you know, do a lot of different things, uh, but that's primarily what we're doing on this project. Again, the, the screen shows kind of the handheld component. Uh, Water One has around, as Brian said, about 150,000 total uh, endpoints or meters out there. About 5% of the meters, I think, or uh, roughly 5% are um, inside sets or in, in buildings, in basements. Uh, the rest are uh, pit sets or outside. <clears throat> um, some of them also, the ones that are inside have wall-mounted radios, um, so um, retrofitting those. And we're actually, utility use is also changing about uh, approximately 5,000 meters that are inside sets as part of the project. Um, the Water One uh, project is primarily focused on the FlexNet radio retrofit, but, you know, it is complex because it's got a number of different things going on. Like I mentioned, the inside sets, it's got uh, multiple types of meters, multiple resolutions, uh, because we're, we have to activate the radios out there in the resolution they are, whether they're 1,000 gallon, 100 gallon, or one gallon, if they're, the resolutions, we, it needs to be correct. So uh, census is changing that, but anyway. The, the whole point is it, there is some complexity because of the meter types and ages of meters. Um, in order to provide better information water one, you know, we pass that through the census r and which can automatically reach out to those and reprogram them down to one or 10 gallon, depending on the size of the meter. 
and what it can read up to. Uh, talking about resolutions, this really re leads up to our next uh, poll question on how do your meters read. Joe, do you want to take that over, please? Sure thing. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. So um, we do have a poll question here. I'll go ahead and read it to you all, and we can go ahead and launch it. So uh, the question is, what resolution do the majority of your residential water meters uh, in the water network read? So uh, a couple options here. We got ones or point ones, you know, gallons or cubic feet. So don't worry about the units. Just tell us roughly the magnitude of the resolution. So ones, tens, hundreds, or thousands. And um, we'll go ahead and hit go on that and get some responses in. And uh, while we're doing that, you know, um, in terms of deployment, you know, Mike's team in a nutshell is really completing that smart point radio installation and then leaving the site. But the meter um, or the register, you know, if it's a census model manufactured somewhere roughly after 2002, can actually be reprogrammed um, from the previous resolution down to uh, one gallon in the case of Water One's residential meters. And, um, and so as you guys are submitting these responses, you know, we're curious just to see for the audience, what are you guys reading in? And we'll tell you more about why Water One uh, was looking at changing some of these reg resolutions. So let's see if we've got responses coming in. We do have about 18% reading in ones or point ones, all right, and about 30% in tens, 22 in hundreds, and 27% in thousands. So a lot of the times when we're in hundreds or thousands, you know, that makes a lot more sense from the AMR standpoint uh, when we're doing walk by drive by reading. We certainly don't need ones of gallons. Uh, you know, if we have uh, six or 12 data points per month. And then I do see tens and ones. And so that, that's more common as we get more into the AMI type of fixed space systems. Um, so we'll, we'll leave that there and jump back to the presentation. The reason, you know, we're, we're really talking about this is uh, it's the impact of meter resolution. And so why one gallon re resolution or, or why do we try and strive for the best resolution possible for a given meter type? Um, and the answer is that, um, you know, when we're moving from six data points per year to one data point per hour, there's really an opportunity to make good use of the higher resolution consumption data. And to, to help explain that, I've got this little animation here. So imagine you're reading in hundreds, right? Maybe it's a five, five dial set up in hundreds of gallons. Uh, your consumption, you know, for a residential customer, maybe it's a single family home, uh, could look something like this, right? A kind of a spiky pattern. You're only seeing uh, the increment when you hit 100 gallons. Um, and, and that's kind of what it looks like. It's really hard to see the hourly pattern, uh, let alone a, a daily pattern. Um, and it, there's just not a lot of information you can get about, uh, from this uh, pattern here. But if we consider bringing it down to tens, so we're going to add one more dial there, right? We're at six reading in tens. Now that same consumption pattern. Uh, could look like this, the blue line that you see there in tens of gallons. And, um, you know, the, one way to think about this is kind of like pixels of a picture. Um, we, we now have a clearer picture, um, still a little bit spiky, a little bit blocky, but uh, we do have a better sense of what's happening hour by hour. And then contrast that to the, the actual consumption uh, in gallons. So now we're down to seven dials, reading in ones of gallons, and the black dotted line is the actual behavior. And you can see that's much clearer. We can see hour by hour, uh, you know, the, the water consumption. And what that really allows us to do is it enables us to, uh, for example, in Water One's case, roll out a useful customer portal where they can log in and see their hourly usage. Uh, it also can be helpful for consumption profiling. Let's say we want to get a sense of uh, what does the diurnal pattern for irrigation customers look like, or maybe it's something system-wide, like a water loss analysis that is actually done at the hour time scale. These are all applications that can build on this higher resolution data. And so that's, that's why we're doing it. And now the question is, how are we doing it? And that's the reconfiguration process. So we talked about with Mike, how utility use finishes up on site, and that actually initiates a process where the network uh, reprograms the register over the air. And so this all starts when the Nova Center software drops a file to the, soft, the census head end system, all right? And that file basically has a listing of all the endpoints and meters that were activated that day. What we do is we build in a 12 hour waiting period during which uh, you know, the SmartPoint radio is sending a series of messages containing important information like the, 
the meter serial number, and so on and so forth. And once that passes, we start to uh, send down messages and, and confirm some information. For example, uh, we're verifying the meter ID matches what's in the CIS. We're verifying the firmware. Uh, we're checking the register type. And then what we're determining is whether we can actually reprogram the meter or not. So if it's in hundreds and we want it down to ones, we have to check that it's actually a census meter and can take that command. If it can, we will reprogram it and we'll also reprogram the radio to match it. And if it can't, what we'll do is audit it. So, you know, the situation of where it can't, that might be a third party meter uh, where we can't actually change the register dials. Um, and that's kind of how that shakes out. And in the end, we end up with kind of an export file. So for each day, here's what was completed. And that allows us to pass through a batch of finished uh, endpoints and installations to uh, the Water One CIS system. And this process is all tracked using a daily report that shows success metrics and disposition for each batch of installs. So um, I wanna turn it back over to Mike to talk a little bit more about the, the cost and time savings that go into the reconfiguration process. Um, go ahead, Mike, and, and uh, let's hear more about that topic. Thanks, Joe. Uh, our field personnel spent about eight minutes, you know, in a typical site, um, that's to install the radio, uh, connect everything up, uh, radio activation, and um, collecting quite a bit of data, pictures, et cetera. Uh, we, we haven't done an exhaustive analysis, but um, not having to reprogram in the field does save time. Uh, the estimate is it'll, it'll save our installers about three to four minutes to eliminate that reprogram step and they don't have to have the additional equipment required to do that. Uh, that you know, if you do the math, it comes out to approximately uh, 146,000, roughly 150,000, somewhere in there. Uh, basically, a dollar a, a install to save the time. The uh, there are occasions though where you know, it, it doesn't consider, you know, there are occasions where remote configuration could fail for some reason. And, um, but to me, the the process really helps because it, it leads to uh, increased accuracy, increased validation, having the over the air process do the additional, you know, automated data checks as well as doing the reprogramming. So Joe, uh, your slide. Yeah, thanks, Mike. So I want to pass it back to Brian here to talk a little bit um, more about some of the validation Water One does on their side uh, after the census and utility use process has wrapped up the, the programming and, and the field work. Sure, thank you, Joe and, and, and Mike for, for, uh, for that. The, uh, well, the main reason is we're doing a lot of reprogramming and multipliers and affecting our, our CIS system and our billing system. And so, Yes, we want all this data information, but the primary thing first is it's got to be correct in our billing system. So because of all these multipliers and changing, so it's great information. They do a great job putting it all together, but we're just double-checking against what we're seeing in the census network. That's the RNI, and comparing it to our SAP or our, our customer information system with the data. So the nice thing about the, the – one a couple good things, but one thing nice thing about the network is we're able to get the read from the network, so it eliminates – any human error as far as a misread or trying to put in, you know, like a move in, move out read to to change that meter register. So the data checks that we do is making sure the serial numbers and flex IDs match, uh, the number of dials and the resolution matches. You know, we're typically changing a lot of our meters, what we call from a five dial times 100 to seven dial times one gallon. So we just got to make sure that the information is done correctly. And really the only errors that we might see, and I don't know if I would call them errors, there's just something went wrong in the field with, with the meters and just kind of requires just a further check to see what's going on. So we're just, I don't know if you call it double or triple validating the data before we put it into our billing system, which is extremely important. Now, this is an example of, you know, what would happen if there was an, an error that occurred. This wasn't done from utility, so don't, not from that regard. It's just one of our, our field employees was making a change to a register, and it, he didn't quite get the correct register group. And on the top, this is coming from our, our MDM system, but there's a validation check just to make sure that, is this even plausible? And uh, so what this meter failed on is uh, max daily usage. It was just physically, well, basically what happened, he wound up creating or adding a hundred multiplier to a register or to a meter register that was reading to the nearest gallon. So that's just uh, not 
well, wasn't feasible, and it got uh, kicked out. So on the raw register reads, just just shows in that middle row there what happened when we tried to put in those two extra zeros. It just obviously doesn't fit from a pattern perspective, and uh, and Compass kicked it out. So what? Um, I guess I got to turn back to Joe, and we'll continue on from there. Thanks, Brian. So um, as we, you know, look at how Water One is transitioning towards AMI, uh, there's really a lot that this network can do beyond just the, the metering component um, and, and the billing component. And, um, you know, looking to the future, um, I'm going to go ahead and toss it right back to you, Brian, to talk about some of the use cases uh, y'all are looking at in terms of, uh, you know, what we're doing beyond metering. Um, so go ahead, Brian. Thanks. All right, thanks. So well, one of the things we've noticed interesting about our customers and during irrigation season is, you know, if all things being considered and, you know, rainfall has been the normal days without rain, our customers seem to prefer to water or water more on Monday, Wednesday, Friday than they do on Tuesday and Thursday. And our speculation might be that an irrigation contractor, that's just what they default when they put in someone's programming into the irrigation system. So we do have a program that's Kind of, not widely known, but we call it, you know, water wisely, where we prefer, prefer our even and odd customers from addresses to water on those days of the week. Not that we're having a restrictions or anything like that, but if we decided that, you know, it would be beneficial to try to maybe balance the daily uh, demands from day to day during the week, uh, we would be able to uh, focus on those group of people and maybe try to get them to move their, move their irrigation usage. And then with the customer portal, again, next spring is when we anticipate launching it. We've gone through a, a, a beta portal, portal rollout by utilizing Water One employees as our testers. And what this is just showing a kind of a basic dashboard at this time. The uh, graph on the left is just showing the daily usage, and the red line is just what the temperature, high, max temperature was that day. If you drill in a little bit further, you would be able to get into your hourly consumption. And then on the right, it would just be if they want to set up a way to compare how they're doing from month over month or eventually we get enough data uh, year over year just to see how they're utilizing uh, water efficiently. And just some things that we've seen. This is actually, well, I want to you know, give credit to what Carla has seen. So this is a meter that you're looking at the bottom left. The consumption is increasing and decreasing. It's going above and below zero, if you will. And uh, the term that she's coined, it's a, it's a heartbeat meter. So we were baffled by what in the world is going on with this, but it, it eventually just stopped having any flow going through it. So what this is showing is a before and after of replacing that meter. And uh, uh, probably two things on the right-hand side is, well, we're not seeing any negative flow anymore, so it had nothing to do with a backflow issue. It was just something going on with that meter. And you can see that the consumption that the customer normally is using has increased over those uh, what was going on with that meter before. So we'll be utilizing information to to find those meters. And then utilizing our network, so the graph, uh, the image on the left is really just a, a map of our service area. And if you, if you take a chance and count it, there's eight different pressure zones that we have in our, our service area. So on the left is our pressure zones, on the right is just a topographical or a heat map of what our pressures range throughout our service area. For us, uh, the really dark blue is the uh, heavy, the high pressure areas above, above 150 PSI. And then the, uh, the lighter colors, as you get to the lighter colors, gets to our, you know, our minimum service level of 40 PSI. So we have a range of pressures that we would like to be able to find some more information and monitor on that. And a couple ways we'll be able to do that is a couple tools from Census. So on the left, if you haven't seen that before, that's a, the Ally water meter that you can utilize from a customer service perspective to do remote disconnect. But also what's included in that meter is a pressure and temperature sensor. So we have a pilot program going on right now with 10 Ally meters where I located two of them in a place that our distribution division was interested in finding some additional pressure information to see what this network can do. And then uh, the image on the right is what census calls our smart gateway. So you're able to bring back two digital and two analog points, if you like, back through the network. So really anything from an analog perspective, you can do four to 20 milliamps on, you can bring back, but we could bring back pressure or any, anything else that has a, has a four to 20 uh, milliamp range for that. So I will now turn this over to Joe. Thanks, Brian. So, you know, as, as Brian mentioned, Water One is looking, 
uh, towards some additional applications beyond the metering and, and the billing. And, and the two-way AMI network that they've invested in here is really going to serve as the backbone for a number of those use cases. And, and those use cases really span uh, the whole water cycle um, from source water all the way to wastewater. So, for instance, you know, we, we have seen customers uh, monitor their source water reservoir levels um, using that, that smart gateway device that Brian just mentioned. Um, and they're also tracking things like uh, pH and, and dissolved oxygen in reservoirs, which can help them uh, you know, it can help them be informed uh, about the impact of, of runoff, rain, temperature, et cetera, and how that can impact downstream treatment processes. Um, you know, in terms of uh, source water, we also have well uh, level. We do have customers that are doing that um, as another way to inform on, on source capacity. Getting more into the distribution system, uh, we are seeing customers connect online chlorine analyzers and, and bring back residual values across FlexNet. And, uh, you know, likewise, in terms of distribution applications, we are seeing uh, district metered areas, DMA meters, uh, you know, where we have master meters that are feeding a, a sub area of the network, and that can help us subdivide the water system and inform on water loss with a little bit more resolution. Um, we also have pressure monitoring, another key use case there that Brian just mentioned, um, you know, that can be done at a variety of different sites, including commercial and industrial meters. Uh, as well as residential meters, right? We do have the Ally meter uh, with the built-in pressure sensor. That same meter has a built-in temperature sensor, um, which can be a really interesting data point uh, when it comes to water quality, especially at areas in the system like dead ends uh, that don't see a lot of usage. And then finally, you know, all the way to the wastewater system, uh, we are seeing applications there where customers are uh, trending levels and uh, looking at float switches uh, wired up to the smart gateway in order to inform on, uh, you know, wastewater and collection system assets such as lift stations um, uh, and even uh, air vac, uh, you know, sewer state, uh, vacuum sewer systems. So really interesting use cases across the whole water cycle. And, you know, with that in mind, just to wrap up here, um, you know, you've heard Water One's story and where they're going from here, and um, we've talked about why they're transitioning to AMI, uh, including some of the requirements and the cost-benefit analysis that went into that. Uh, you know, moving into the installation and the deployment process, we did cover how Water One is partnering with Util Use and Census to put in practice uh, really kind of a novel approach where the meter radios are, are actually installed and configurations are updated later. Uh, over the air. And then we covered why high resolution consumption data is beneficial and also how Water One intends to use that data. And then finally, we talked about uh, how this whole AMI network will serve as the, the kind of the foundation for additional use cases um, looking towards the future. And so with that, we are going to have uh, an opportunity for, for questions here. We've got about 12 minutes left. And I want to introduce here uh, to join us in the Q&A session uh, two folks, so Carla um, from Water One and also Bill uh, from Util Use. So let's go ahead and, and kick that off and um, I'll turn it back over to, to Andrew. Great, Joe, and uh, yeah, thanks Thanks again. A great presentation, everyone. I think I was, uh, I think I was correct in my assumption at the, at the top that uh, we'd have a really nice, uh, well-rounded <laughs> Uh, view of this project uh, with all, all of your great perspectives on it. So I uh, really appreciate it. Um, so Carla, let me let me bring you into the fold here to start off. Uh, you know, at, at the beginning, um, when when Brian was sort of teeing up uh, what led you guys to, to start this project, and he talked about some of the the slow or or stuck meters. Um, question along those lines. Uh, so so for a slow or a stuck meter, um, what other patterns or behaviors? are you using to, to find those? All right, thanks, uh, Andrew. Um, yeah, the, the biggest thing that we noticed was really the negative consumption. And uh, as we started kind of looking at meters that were moving backwards, there were multiple reasons why and started kind of establishing patterns. And, you know, there is an actual backflow case, like in a main break. and but then we started noticing some that were frequently moving backwards. And as we looked at those and had our field crews investigate, that's where we saw that pattern where, well, when they're moving backwards, sometimes it actually means they're slowing or they're going to be stuck soon. So that negative consumption was very, very helpful. 
Okay, and 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 Bill, coming to you next. Uh, so, what, can you explain the difference between programming the smart point versus programming the register in the field? Yeah, sure, Andrew. Uh, basically, the smart point we're programming frequency of read, how often it's going down and grabbing information from that meter's register to send back to the RNI. And with the register, we've got such a vast array of registers out there. Some, as Brian mentioned, are very old meters, those 20 plus year old meters. Uh, we can't program uh, register resolution, but the vast majority of their registers are programmable, so we're making sure that they're programmed correctly. Okay, and, and another one for you, Bill. Is this the first time you're doing a deployment with the remote configuration aspect? And just talk about how much of an impact that really has. Yeah, sure. This is uh, really the first time that we've done this, and uh, it, it's had a really positive impact. I mean, there's a couple of areas, and I think Mike kind of hit on it during the presentation, is that it does save some time. Uh, you know, there's a – and time essentially is money, so we were able to sharpen our pencil when we bid the project a little bit better having doing this process, but, uh, you know, it allows our uh, installers to be more productive during the day. So a guy that may normally do uh, 25 a day is now doing 30 a day. So productivity and accuracy plays into it as well. Okay, and, and just sort of continuing along those lines, I, I want to jump over to Mike. Um, Mike, can you talk a little bit about what information is captured during field site visits and how that's used? Sure. Um, the you know the key information that's being collected is uh, the radio ID and how, you know that it's at the right address and how it's programmed and things like that, as well as the pictures associated with the install and the completed install. Uh, depends on, you know, we, we collect different data depending on whether we're changing the meter or just doing a uh, radio retrofit. So, um, but, you know, the key is to get the right data into billing um, so that they can uh, swap the radio out if there was an old radio from one of their old systems or make the transition to AMI. All right. Uh, you know, kind of an interesting question came here from our audience, uh, and I can't remember which one of you mentioned it. I know it was towards the end there. Uh, you know, it was, a, it was an interesting observation about the, the irrigation usage uh, during Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, the question is, are you incentivizing users to shift to Tuesday, Thursday, and what, what program does that, what does that program look like? Well, the, this is Brian, and I'm the one who brought it up in the, in the presentation, so I'll give it a shot mm -hmm. here. So we're, we're not incentivizing our, our customers to move. We're just gently with a messaging campaign because uh, we don't want to give them the perspective that we have a uh, you know some sort of a supply issue or anything like that. So we're but we just would like to appreciate it. It's, it's a program called it is called Water Wisely. It's on our website, but we're trying and there occasionally we have bill insert or something like that to to uh, inform our customers that uh, it'd be beneficial if you could follow like an odd even pattern. So we're not really going out and making sure that that occurs, but uh, if we, it, it, but it'd be something that we'd like to see. Okay, and, and Brian, just sticking with you, uh, I, I think these next couple questions uh, w would really apply to you um, uh, or, or Carla. Um, first off, are, are you, t talk about where you guys are in the deployment. Is it finished or how far along are you? Yeah, I can give that. Uh, so we're roughly about 80% installed and uh, you know, our contract with census or utility use is, well, the census is uh, substantial completion date of May 31st of 2021, and that shouldn't be a problem for utility use to make that. We did have, we've got about 4,100 inside meters that uh, we are about ready to send out a postcard that say about March 3rd of this year, and we didn't quite remember March, whatever, right in the middle of March, which obviously that didn't happen. <laughs> so uh, we just, they finally just got able to get back into last month of scheduling appointments to replace inside meters. So that will go longer, but uh, so we're about 80%, 80% complete with the project right now. All right. And talk about the, the customer service a little bit. Obviously, that, that becomes a huge uh, part of 
of, of AMI projects, um, you know, I, I think, and, you know, you, you talked about how uh, obviously with your, you know, bi-monthly billing and six data points a year, and now you're, you know, that's increasing tremendously and you can provide, you know, you can use this to provide a lot more information to customers. Talk about how this has kind of changed your approach to, to customer service. Sure, I can think of just two things off the top of my head. So right now, you know, we can see customer leaks. And so what we've decided to do just in the interim before we get, get a little further along in this project is the parameters we've set up is if we see that you've had a leak of 20 gallons an hour for 72 hours, uh, we will go ahead and, and notify you of that. And, of course, I don't think there's a customer out there who's been upset that we've let them know that they've that they've got a leak for this long. I think when we get a little bit further along in the project, we'll be able to tighten that down a little bit more, but we also didn't know how many – we could actually handle so that's where we that's where our current threshold is and then i just had a a, a uh, customer that was unsure why their irrigation meter used so much more water this year and it was just really nice to send them the information about it appears that your meter actually just never shut off i mean it you may have thought it was turned off but you could just see that information and be able to show to them that it's there was not an issue with us reading the meter it was something you had had downstream so um and then allow them to try to figure out where that where that either a valve controller or something like that was causing an issue so it's it's been, it's been very helpful for our customers and our customer service reps too to be able to talk to our customers and uh explain what we're seeing now um after the meter very good. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna spend a couple more minutes going through some questions here. Uh, just once again for our for our audience, uh, you know, everyone's still on with us. If anybody has any questions, feel free to to go ahead and uh, you know type those in the the questions box on the left there, and uh, you know we'll, we'll take a look at them as they come through and uh, try to get to them. Uh, one more for you, Brian. Uh, you know, I, I'm I'm wondering going back to your slide uh, towards the beginning when you were talking about the the 20 year life cycle cost and you were kind of looking at how the project would impact, you know, what the cost would be to customers. Um, can you explain that a little bit more? I'm, I'm wondering, because was it, you, you mentioned that it actually would not result in a, in really a rate increase. Is, is that correct? Or what was the, the ultimate conclusion of that? Yeah, that was correct. We were evaluating just the, the traditional meter reading costs versus, versus these capital and ongoing costs that we're having with software as a service and network as a service, and they ultimately just wound up basically balancing out at the end of the with the 20-year life cycle. We did actually look out a little further. I didn't provide this information. I'm not, I don't have it in front of me. Okay, well, after 20 years, you're going to have to do something again. So we did actually look out and did a 40-year run on that too, and it, it still showed that we were uh, able to – install a system like this and uh, not impact our, our customer's monthly bill or bi-monthly bill. That, it, and did that life cycle cost analysis only consider meter reading? Yeah, so we were not, we weren't, we weren't evaluating other savings you might find with an AMI system. This was just comparing it to the traditional uh, reading a meter for a bill. And, uh, yep. and we just wanted to, to show that it, there was not any additional cost to uh, put in a system like this. And then because of that, we're able to get all this additional information. Has there, has there been any um, discussion or uh, any thoughts on how you will account for some of the additional benefits from, from AMI just, uh, I guess with regards to the maybe the, some of the future cost savings and how, how that's going to impact kind of financial planning in the future. Yeah, I, I don't have a great answer for that, however, because we, we do know there are additional cost savings that are uh, associated with an AMI system, but uh, we have not yet sat down with our finance. Finance helped us put this together, and then we just not have, have not gone back, and uh, we, will, we will evaluate that in the future because we do know there will be additional um, cost savings with an AMI system that we'd like to, to demonstrate, but uh, I don't know when we'll do that. Okay. Very good. Uh, Mike, I'm going to come back to you for one uh, question here. What devices does the field work order software, which is the the Novus Center, uh, what does that run on? And is there an is there an app for that uh, that you can access on your phone? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Um, it, right now we run on Android or on uh, Apple iOS. So uh, yes, it is an app, and uh, you know, typically uh, on a census project we run on. Android because right now since it supports uh, the field logic software to activate the radios on Android but they are they will be supporting iOS soon I understand so. okay 
And Bill, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you for, for one more. Um, what equipment do the field install crew need to carry on site during the installations? Um, do, do they need everything from, from one device or you know, can, you, can you talk about that a little bit? No, there's actually a couple of devices that they're carrying. Uh, as Mike mentioned, the main device is the Android, uh, and it does have uh, cellular capability because they do data dumps multiple times a day. So we can actually see work orders done in the morning uh, or uploaded to the system, and I have visibility at that point. But they also have the census command link that is the intermediary communication device with the smart point. And we also carry touch readers to do any troubleshooting. Uh, occasionally, we'll run into a pinched wire where we may have to splice on a, a, a new touch sensor or something. So there's a number of pieces of equipment, but uh, thankfully, most of those troubleshooting problems don't exist. They're just few and far between. Right. Okay, um, we're, we have just uh, another couple from our audience that I want to I, I want to get to, and we'll wrap up here in just a couple of minutes. Um, coming back to to Brian and Carl, I think these these might be best for you. Um, the the billing cycle has has that been? Are you guys going to keep that at bi monthly, or have you considered moving that to a, a monthly? How, how will that continue? Well, what I this is Brian. So what I didn't present in the business case, our original business case was going to monthly, and we would actually have a faster payback, if you will, because we'd have we'd be able to release a negative cash reserve. And when you have a bi-monthly, and you know we don't bring enough money in the winter time, you got to have a cash reserve in order to pay your bills that we make up for our cash flow in the summertime. If that hopefully that all makes sense. So we took that part out and uh, just came back and just stayed up bi-monthly. However, our finance uh, division is interested in going to monthly. I don't I recommend it to them because let's get this project done then first, um, and then we can take a look at it. So we kind of have a feeling that you know, when our customers are getting bills from us, even though these are bi-monthly bills, if they're getting to the point where they're close to $100, you know, maybe it might be time to start looking at that bi-monthly. So um, a couple surveys we've done, our customers seem to be interested in wanting to go to monthly, but uh, they're not quite totally sold on it yet. So I think eventually we'll get to monthly. All right, and, and going back to, to, to the earlier stages, can you talk a little bit about the process of, of selecting census um, for the project? Uh, you know, your, sort of your evaluation criteria, um, and, and then what about the uh, bringing on um, utility use as the installer, was that a, uh, a separate procurement? Uh, can you talk a little bit about that. Yeah, we actually, in our RFP, could have entered into four different contracts. So we could have done the network, the installer, the MDM, the meter data management system, the customer portal. Uh, there was maybe a little bit of weight given to them to be nice to just have one contract as opposed to negotiating four. And uh, so we evaluated installation contractors against each other along with uh, what was offered by Census from an installation perspective. And we really liked what we saw with uh, Utilities' uh, presentation and, and their, their Nova Center, that their ability to install a Census system. So we liked – and Census had partnered with Utilities in their presentation, and we really liked – the way they were going to work together. So that's why we had that. We just have the one contract. Actually, our contract was census, but um, you know, it was census and utility use. So we um, also liked the la less census has less infrastructure required for the network. So the part of the bad, the interesting thing about being a quasi municipality is we don't have that much property. So it's not like you can go to our police stations or anything like that. And, and if you're looking for a place to put up a, a collector or an antenna, uh, you're going to have to go out and find some third-party uh, antennas to connect to, which is the majority of what Census has done for our system. Uh, they do have four collectors on four of our water towers, but the rest of the uh, collectors are on third-party antennas. And, you know, we you know, like the, the touch read system and the touch coupler that Census has. So if we wound up using somebody else's system, which we could have, we would have had to cut off all the touch couplers and, and basically gel cap or somehow make a connection to somebody else's system, which was – in everyone's proposal to do that, but it's just some a little bit risky to have to cut everything off. Right. Um, another good question came in here, and I, I believe this is again referring to your your slide on the the, the life life cycle cost um, on the payback. Was the was the AMR customer payback 
shorter than the all customers uh, because the radios were already in place for AMR customers? Well, no, those uh, were battery operated too. And so those uh, AMR, that AMR system had only a battery life of 15 years. And, and so it lined up with the contract we had and they were going to have to get replaced. So really the savings on that is the fact that we would, in order to go back to monthly meter reading those manually, we'd have to hire, I don't remember how many people it was, but there'd be all these additional meter readers that we would have to bring on to read the meters uh, manually. So that's why the payback for our monthly customers is uh, much quicker than it is than just breaking even with our residential customers. Okay, and uh, Carla, since we only uh, got one for you, let me let me bring you back in for one more. Um, do you think moving to AMI and having all of this sort of validation in place will impact apparent losses uh, in terms of the unaccounted for water? Have you seen some of that already? Well, I wouldn't say that we've actually seen it yet just because we're still in installation, but um, certainly if you think about you know, your unaccounted for water and how it's calculated, we do test our meters. So, you know, we have a, an idea of our meter accuracy, but being able to see the meters and as we uh, we'll be implementing a health module. Um, we'll be able to hopefully capture some of those meters that are slowing quicker and catch that revenue. And just having the the accuracy, being able to see it and being able to uh, replace on a more timely basis, I certainly would mm -hmm. hope that it it affects that mm -hmm. unaccounted for water. Okay. And and Brian, final question to you, just to to wrap up here. Um, just, just any, can you can you give us some concluding thoughts on, on you know now that you're you're into this project after you know obviously you guys you know on this presentation I think you did a great job of like I said kind of explaining all the different pieces that go into it um, you know what are some of the the things that you might do differently or or uh, uh, you know just to address some of the challenges that you might have had or or you know any any advice to other utilities kind of going into a similar project. What, you know, can, you, can you offer any sort of concluding thoughts along those lines? <laughs> Yeah, I think you were asking maybe it's like a lessons learned or something like that. So, yeah. uh, you know, I did ask, we did ask a lot of questions from other utilities. So we've got, uh, you know, in the Kansas City area, we're maybe towards the end or the last one of the last ones that have in installed an AMI system so uh, or an AMR, whichever you want to call it. And, and it gave me an opportunity to talk to, you know, Kansas, Missouri, Kansas City, Kansas. There's another, another utility south of here uh, called Olathe that has it. Uh, talk to, you know, so I recommend just talk to people. That was probably the best thing I got out of it, just to hear um, information that, you may not be thinking about like one thing that pops my mind it was just the importance of the data is like well what do you why do you want to get all this data and so if you're going to get all this data be prepared to utilize it so we wanted to make sure we install a meter data management system with this network so we could start utilizing this information so that's one you know one example um, and lesson learned yeah we wanted to be able to reprogram all our meters we thought we knew our whole meter population pretty well but we you know turned out there were a few more meters than I anticipated that we aren't able to reprogram but you know, just there, that was probably the, more of the biggest surprise um, that caught me off guard a little bit. But uh, we will be able to work our way through it, and uh, and it's these older meters that uh, really, from an asset management perspective, it's about time to replace them anyway. So it, I'm trying to, it works out well, but that we did need to replace, we will need to replace them eventually. So I just recommend talk to your peers and and um, and get a perspective to make sure you know what you're getting into. Yeah, very good. All right, guys. Well, I, I, I think that's, that's a lot of time. I, I want to go ahead and wrap up. Um, thanks again for, for the presentation. Uh, if, if we have any questions that we weren't able to get to, I, I know some still might be coming in. I know the census folks will uh, work to get those answered offline. Uh, so thanks again to, to Carla, Brian, Mike, Bill, and Joe for, for your great uh, presentation and, and participation. Thanks again to Census uh, for sponsoring this webinar. Uh, we will eventually have this uh, archived on our website, uh, waterfm.com is, is our website, uh, if you'd like to refer back to it. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll go ahead and close, uh, and we look forward to having everyone back on, on our next webinar. Thanks, everyone. Take care.